Life Audio. Christian Parent Crazy World with Catherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent. Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you be a godly parent in an ungodly world. I am your host, Katherine Seegers, and in today's episode, we will tackle this critically important question, how can we train our children to challenge our culture, and how can we do that ourselves? Now, we are continuing in our series on truth with this episode. I gave you a really good recap of how we got here in the last episode, so I won't do that again. And technically, this is going to be our last episode in this series on truth. As I said before, though, every episode deals with truth, but now we're going to use the information we have been discussing in this series on truth to springboard to other topics in our culture, in our faith, and in our family. One thing we know from studying scripture and history is that truth is countercultural. So if we want to stay grounded in the truth, we need to expect to live a countercultural life. This episode is very closely related to episode 19, which was six guidelines to living a countercultural life. There, there is a little bit of overlap here, but that episode was more of a safeguard for our faith. It was more protective or defensive. This episode, on the other hand, is more proactive. It is more offensive. That is not to say offensive. We don't want to offend needlessly, but you know, let's face it, on some level, we have we have to recognize that truth is always offensive. I've talked about that before. The Pharisees didn't murder Jesus because they agreed with him. They murdered Jesus because he disagreed with them in ways that threatened their power, their earthly kingdom. This episode is about going on the offense. It's about being a force for good in the way we engage others to think and act. You know, we've been talking about all the ways truth is being silenced in our culture. These guidelines will help you and your kids challenge the lies that are all around us. This is a list of best practices. These seven guidelines will help you and your kiddos challenge cultural lies and lead others to the truth. If they're willing, and some people aren't, but we got to try. And and today I'm going to show you how. And you know, really, this is the perfect way to springboard into all of those other spiritual and cultural topics because it It connects the dots of everything we have been talking about in this series on truth into a handy dandy guide going forward as we engage our culture, our communities, and our families as a force for good. And that's that's what we want to be as godly parents, a force for good in our families, in our, our schools and churches and communities, and in our world. By the way, by the way, I'm writing an article containing these guidelines as well for Crosswalk. So check the show notes uh, or my website for that. You know, I'm going to have a a brief synopsis, very brief, like Instagram synopsis. Well, check out my Instagram, by the way, uh, and subscribe there. Uh, I I would love to have you come on board with me there because I I post some really inspiring and encouraging stuff for you there. And I do little reviews of some of the podcasts that are so helpful for you there. So um, the, the article and my Instagram page is going to give you a nice review of all these guidelines. That's the plan for this episode of CPCW. So let's get started. No te pierdas la historia no contada de Elizabeth I. El rey ha muerto. Una producción original de Stars Play. Ya anheláis poder, princesa. Su juego es aprovechar o matar. No me matarán. ¿Qué es lo que queréis? Volver a ser como era. Becoming Elizabeth. Ahora nuevas series en streaming solo en Starsplay. Play. 
No te pierdas la historia no contada de Elizabeth I. El rey ha muerto. Una producción original de Stars Play. Ya anheláis poder, princesa. Su juego es aprovechar o matar. No me matarán. ¿Qué es lo que queréis? Volver a ser como era. Becoming Elizabeth. Ahora nuevas series en streaming solo en Stars Play. Alrighty, we are going to jump right in with these seven guidelines for challenging our culture. But first, let me just say very quickly that as always, we must approach every topic concerning our faith and our culture with compassion and love. That must be the underlying current of everything we say and do as we engage our culture. We must always, always maintain the dignity of the people we disagree with and recognize that if our witness is compromised by our tone, well, you know, we've, we've completely defeated our purpose. And more importantly, God's purpose. We must not sacrifice our loving witness in order to be right. But with that being said, we must speak what our faith teaches, what is true, and hear is how we do that. Guideline number one, always define your terms. This is the very first thing you learn to do in a formal logic class or in debate. What do you mean by that term? What does our culture or the media or this scientist or this study or this professor or, or even this pastor mean by that word. Is their definition consistent with reality? Is it consistent with science or, or biology? Is it consistent with truth? When applicable, we should even ask, is it consistent with scripture? Define words and insist on definitions that are consistent with reality. You know, we have been talking about the critical importance of words a lot in this series on truth. Our culture is redefining words, making them mean their opposite, taking away any concept of universal reality or truth that lines up with objective reality. We must insist that that definitions are consistent with reality. You know, I, I talked about this example in the last episode. Senator Marsha Blackburn of the great state of Tennessee used this very guideline, defining your terms in the hearings for our next Supreme Court justice. She asked Katanji Brown Jackson a very simple question. She asked her to define a term. She asked her to define the word woman. You know, that is really not a hard question. It, it should be a softball. Just a few years ago, we, we pretty much agreed on this definition. We've agreed about what this word meant for thousands of years. But our culture is redefining the definition of commonly held words. Jackson, of course, as I'm sure you know, refused to answer. She she blustered and finally said, you know, I'm, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, Houston, we've got a big problem when a person nominated to the Supreme Court because she is a woman cannot define what a woman is. This, this nominalist denial of universal reality, the reality of womanhood is not consistent with the real world world with with science or biology or with our mirrors. Now, look, I know, I know our culture wants to split semantical hair saying that sex and gender are different now. And that is really a bigger topic than we have time to get in here today. But that split is not consistent with with biology or reality or the Christian faith, which is consistent with both biology and reality. Insist on the proper definitions of terms, challenge the denial of truth in our definitions, and teach your kids to do this as well. Guideline number two, question everything. I gave you this directive in episode 19, and I told you there was going to be a little overlap here. This is the only one that overlaps, but I'm giving it again because it is so, so important. And I'm going to elaborate quite a bit with a lot of new information here and, uh, and a little bit of old. Here's the old. I just loved this example that I gave you in that episode. It was, uh, I think it was guideline number three. I gave you the example before of a young woman who escaped from 
from North Korea. Her name was Yeonmi Park, and she ended up at Columbia University. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she believed that her leader, the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, was starving because that is what she had been told all of her life. So she kept looking at the pictures of a man who was clearly not starving. He is very robust. Unlike the rest of the North Koreans who were starving, this guy, you know, he had plenty to eat. But she believed, she actually believed that he was starving because she had been taught not to ask questions. She had all the evidence right in front of her face, but Park believed what she had been told rather than what she saw with her own eyes because she didn't question it. Now, on to some new thoughts here. You know, one of the reasons that 6 million Jews died in Nazi Germany during World War II is because not enough people asked questions. Where are you taking my neighbor? Why are you taking my neighbor? Too many people just sat back and let it happen. But really, the lack of questions began long before, you know, Hitler was pushing a very false narrative about the Jews long before he started carting them off to concentration camps. This is from an article, this quote is from an article on the British Library. It's called Learning Voices of the Holocaust. It says, quote, the Nazis used propaganda campaigns to promote the party's virulent hatred of Jews. This attitude towards Jews is known as anti-Semitism. It can take different forms, institutional, physical, or verbal. The Nazis, by the way, used all three. The, the article goes on to say, quote, the Nazis wanted to portray the Jews as subhuman, inferior beings who were interested primarily in their own economic gain or in communism. The Nazis built upon the negative myths of the Jewish race, which had existed for centuries, end quote. You see what they were doing there? Hitler and the Nazis put false labels on the Jews and not enough people questioned those labels. Hitler characterized the Jews as a, quote, race tuberculosis of the peoples, end quote. <laughs> in other words, they were a disease. So, so Hitler and the Nazis lied about the Jews long before they kidnapped, tortured, and murdered them. They, they convinced the German people that the Jews were an inferior, subhuman, diseased race of people who were eating away at the German nation like a cancer. And many of the German people believed those lies. They didn't question them, not enough. So when the knocks came on the doors in the middle of the night, neighbors started disappearing. Most, not, not all, but most of the German citizens just let it happen. They, they watched it happen. That is how a Holocaust happens when when people don't question the narrative when people don't question the lies they are being told respectfully in a spirit of love and kindness we've got to question everything and we must teach our kids to do this as well you know my my daughter did this with me recently she had a different perspective on Karl Marx than I did she challenged me turns out she had been curious about his upbringing, and so she she researched it and discovered some enlightening information, and she she came to a different conclusion, and we still disagree. Now, neither of us think that he was a good guy, by the way, but, you know, I'm so proud, so proud that she is asking questions, and she is seeking answers from original sources. We must teach our children to question our leaders, question our medical advisors, question their teachers and their professors, question science. You know, I'm gearing up to do a whole episode on science, on how science has become a religion in our culture. And yet the very nature of science demands that we ask questions. Science, true science, is never settled. It welcomes questions. And you know who else we need to question? Our spiritual leaders, again, with respect and in love, question. Do not trust a leader who tells you not to investigate something on your own. Do not mindlessly sit by and believe what you are told. We must question everything. 
Guideline number three, challenge labels. And in parentheses here, I have don't label and discard. The enemy, the father of lies, loves nothing better than to call God a liar. And he loves nothing better than to take anyone who is speaking truth and call them a liar. Challenge these labels. Do not believe what you hear about someone just because everyone is saying it. You know, Jesus was called a blasphemer. Jesus, don't forget that, okay? And the disciples were called rebel rousers and blasphemers too. This is what the world does. They label in order to marginalize and get rid of someone. You know, recently, the media and the White House and political figures on both sides of the aisle were calling for the censorship of the most popular podcaster in the country, Joe Rogan. Now, this guy's no Christian, but he is a free thinker. He questions everything, and that is dangerous to our leaders. Our culture does not like questions. Questions threaten power. Rogan's questions were threatening the narrative that they wanted to sell. It threatened their power. So he had to be silent. So they, you know, they dug up some dirt on the guy and there was some dirt to be found and they called him dangerous. That's how they labeled him, dangerous. And they said that he was helping to spread, quote, misinformation, end quote. And they started putting labels on this guy. Thankfully, it didn't work, not entirely, but they tried. And I just have to add this, though. Part of the reason it didn't work was because Rogan was so big already. He's the biggest podcaster in the world. When this technique is used on people who don't have that kind of clout, it can work. We must not do that. We must not stand by and watch it happen to someone else, even if that is a person we disagree with. A person is more than a label. We should never, ever reduce a person to a label. And we must challenge people who do. Todos los grandes jugadores tienen sus rituales, todos. Como soplarle a los dados, a los dardos, a la petanca y hasta soplarle al test de antígenos para que dé negativo. Sea cual sea tu ritual, en Codere te lo ponemos fácil. Vive la emoción de jugar a las ruletas en vivo de Codere estés donde estés. Descárgala. Así de fácil. Codere. Juega con responsabilidad. Sin diversión no hay juego. Mayores de 18. Todos los grandes jugadores tienen sus rituales. Todos. Como pasarle todo por la cabeza a tu amigo el calvo para darte suerte. Pedro, nunca visites Turquía. Sea cual sea tu ritual, en Codere te lo ponemos fácil. Cobra tus apuestas más rápido y fácil en nuestros más de 2.500 locales y en cajeros. Así de fácil. Codere. Juega con responsabilidad. Sin diversión no hay juego. Mayores de 18. Guideline number four. Don't cancel. Instead, consult. The goal so often in our culture today is to label and then to cancel. But cancel culture is, you know, it's nothing new. Matthew and Zacchaeus, the tax collectors, Mary Magdalene, the demon-possessed prostitute, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery. These were all people who were canceled by their culture. But Jesus didn't cancel them. He consulted with them. And as a result, each and every one of these individuals were radically changed. We must follow Christ's example here. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against powers and, and principalities that manifest themselves in bad ideas, ideas that seek to, to cancel truth. Remember what I talked about in the last episode, words have power, they cast spells. But the truth has nothing to fear. So like Jesus, we must not cancel. We must consult with love and compassion because truth liberates. It heals. It sets people free. So don't follow the world's example. Don't cancel. Instead, consult. Guideline number five, don't censor lies. Defeat them with truth. You know, sometimes our, our culture doesn't flat out cancel someone, although more and more they are attempting to do just that. Sometimes, though, they just they just silence them. They censor someone. As believers, we do not need to use those methods. The world silences what threatens them. But remember this, censoring is a sign of weakness. If what you believe is the truth, you don't have to fear the lie. 
because truth always wins, ultimately. Yes, I mean, okay, look, truth has been oppressed, beaten, and killed throughout history, but it never dies. It is reborn in every generation. In the end, truth always wins because Christ is truth and Christ is eternal. Therefore, truth is eternal. It cannot die. Truth defeats naturally, organically, because truth is what frees us and the soul of mankind longs to be free. Obviously, this is the way the world operates. It censors ideas that it disagrees with. That's why it censors truth. But let's be honest, though. Okay, let's just get really real here. Many of us have experienced Christian circles where where lies were silenced rather than defeated. You can't listen to this or watch that or read that because, well, you know, they contain lies. And I'll be the first to promote the idea that there are some things we should not listen to or watch or read. And we don't want our kids to either. I I do not need to watch porn in order to defeat porn. I can form a perfectly good argument against pornography without ever watching it. There are some things that, that are of no value. But When it comes to our culture, we need to engage with bad ideas and defeat them, not avoid them. God does not censor lies. He defeats them. He he lets them have their day in court, so to speak. And then he defeats them with the truth. That's what we need to do. So we don't have to censor lies. Lies, on the other hand, must censor truth because a lie cannot defeat the truth. Do not fall in the censorship trap that is so ubiquitous in our culture right now and in some Christian circles as well. Don't do it. Mamas and papas, examine every idea and teach your kids to do that as well. Don't censor lies, expose lies with the truth because truth defeats the lie. Guideline number six, use the boycott wisely. Okay. So that may sound like a bit of a contradiction here, but it's not. Boycotts and censoring are not the same thing. We don't want to censor bad ideas, but we may want to boycott bad actors. And I'm using actors in the broad sense here, like like corporations and companies and possibly some individuals when it comes to the products that they may endorse or sell. I'll explain. One powerful tool we have at our disposal in a free market society, which are Society is becoming less and less of these days, but, you know, that's another topic. But we have the tool of the boycott. When a company is supporting something that is unethical, choosing to boycott or to take your business elsewhere is a valid choice. It's a legitimate form of dissent and social pressure. We can use the power of the purse of our piggy banks to affect change. Like I said, this is not censoring, mind you. Censoring is refusing to engage with a bad idea, and we need to engage with bad ideas and defeat them. Boycotting is not that. Boycotting is choosing to not financially support a company or a platform or a person who is doing something unethical or something you disagree with morally. For example, You may choose not to purchase clothing from companies that use slave or child labor. Great choice. You may choose to purchase food or beverages from companies that do not support abortion or organizations that seek to silence free speech or or religious freedom, organizations that support cultural agendas that are contrary to your beliefs. That is honestly getting harder and harder to do these days, but we can try. You know, my husband and I recently decided to take our money out of a major bank and put it into a Christian credit union that is in line with our values and isn't associated with some organizations that we disagree with. That's a great thing to do, but we must use the boycott wisely because while it is not censoring, it can be used to censor. Honestly, this is a bit of a pet peeve of mine. I'd like to give you a prime example here of how the church sometimes uses the boycott the wrong way. 
A few years ago, a number of prominent evangelical ministers called for a boycott of a film series based on a novel by Ayn Rand. Now, Rand was a, a Russian immigrant to the U.S., and she she wrote some very popular works of fiction back in the 1940s and 50s, which have become cult classics and, and certain political arenas or, or circles. But Rand lived under a, she had lived under a horrific totalitarian regime in Russia. Russia. So she had some like serious, serious street cred to speak on these types of issues. And she had a really brilliant mind and an ability to flesh out ideas and their consequences in compelling, albeit kind of two-dimensional story form. Honestly, her, her characters reminded me of comic book story villains and, and heroes. But still, you know, her works were very thought-provoking and valuable. <sighs> but I, I, here's the rub. Rand was an atheist, and her books identified religion as a driving force of evil in the world. And just, you know, some degree, she was right. Look at the Inquisition and the, you know, the Salem witch trials. But, you know, I don't think Christianity or even Catholicism have really the track record of some other religions and certainly not atheism. But, you know, that's also another day's topic. But, you know, I read Rand's work back in my 20s, and I, I found I found her works to be very valuable and, and persuasive and challenging and disturbing and ultimately flawed. I determined that she was kind of half right on most things, right on a lot of political issues and wrong on God and religion, at least, you know, when it comes to the Christian God. But over the years, I've had a lot of meaningful conversations with people who love or hate her work. Knowing what I know about Rand and other philosophers like her has opened doors for me to have some deep spiritual exchanges with people who don't know God. And frankly, you know, I'm just in the know when it comes, when her name comes up in conversations. I couldn't have had those conversations, though, if I hadn't read her works with my spiritual eyes, wide open, always questioning. Now, when Rand's most popular book, uh, it's called Atlas Shrugged, was finally made into a trilogy, the films were marketed to Christians because they espouse a more conservative worldview. It, it honestly, it seemed like a really natural fit. But because Rand challenged belief in God, many evangelicals called for a boycott. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yes. Rand espoused some very bad ideas alongside some very good ideas. And honestly, the films weren't great. But boycotting her work in this instance was a form of censorship. And it makes the weary Christian soldier out on the battlefield fighting back secular ideology feel <sighs> deserted. You know, boycotting bad ideas is, is really censorship. And this kind of boycott doesn't make you pure. It might just make you unable to help a lost soul looking for answers. It might just make you ignorant. So yes, use the boycott when a company or media outlet or a person crosses an ethical line, but use the boycott wisely. Don't boycott to censor bad ideas. No, we defeat bad ideas with good ideas. Guideline number seven at the finish line here. Go directly to the original source. Do not believe what someone says about a source secondhand. Find out for yourself. As I've said, and I'm sure you know, our culture castigates and cancels people. And so often what is being said about someone or something is not accurate. You know, I was, I was in a small group a while back. And we were talking about a notable media figure. This was a Christian guy in the realm of politics. And this woman in the group pipes up and she says, oh, <laughs> well, that guy is a nut job. He believes all kinds of crazy stuff. Now, you know, it just so happens I was, I was pretty familiar with this guy. I'd been following him for years and there was nothing nutty or crazy about him. And <laughs> as it just so happens, I was just listening to a really awesome podcast interview with this guy on the way to the small group. It was a rather odd coincidence, actually. So so I asked the woman, I'm like, why do you think he's a nut job? What, what does he believe that's crazy? And she could not offer me a single example of what the guy believed. Not one. Instead, she quoted, oh gosh, this so gets me. She quoted a Christian website that said he was crazy. <laughs> oh God. 
Okay, no, okay, do me a favor. Please turn your volume down for just a second. Is it down? Okay. (gasps) Okay, now you can turn it back up. Please, please, please do not contribute to this kind of baseless character assassination. That is what the world does. So much of our media coordinates talking points and, and they will form a narrative that you will hear over and over and over. And they love to do this with people who they disagree with. And so often, people will believe the sound bites instead of engaging with what that person's actually said or written themselves. Don't do that. That is how the world operates. That is what the world did to Jesus. We need to operate by a higher standard. That standard requires direct contact with an original source. Then, and only then, are you qualified to have an opinion about that source. Again, I'm not talking about pornography here. I mean, you don't have to look at that to know what it is, okay? I am talking about ideas here, okay? And, I, you know, I just have to give you one more quick example of this. You probably heard that recently Florida passed a bill called the Parental Rights Education Bill. The media and many big-time celebrities jumped on a cultural bandwagon, as they so often do, and they called this bill the Don't Say Gay Bill. They hammered this inaccurate name for the bill across the airwaves. What this bill actually did, though, was restrict teachers from talking about any kind of sexual issue in school for kids ages kindergarten through third grade. It wasn't don't say gay. It was don't say any kind of sex, even biblical sex or sexuality in school with kids ages five to eight. Let the parents choose when and how to do this at home. Furthermore, the bill prevented schools and teachers from allowing children to transition from one gender to the other without informing the parents. And you know what? 60% of the state agreed with this bill. A majority of people on both sides of the political aisle, yeah, a majority of Democrats and Republicans agreed with this bill. But if you didn't do some research and go to the original source, if you believed the false label, you wouldn't realize that you were being lied to. So always, always, always go to the original source. (laughs) So there we go, mamas and papas. That is seven ways we can teach our children to challenge our culture and we can challenge the culture ourselves. Brief, brief recap here. They are, number one, always define your terms. Number two, question everything. Number three, challenge labels. Don't label and discard. Number four, don't cancel. Instead, consult. Number five, don't censor lies. Defeat them with the truth. Number six, use the boycott wisely. Number seven, go directly to the original source. That about wraps up this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World. One one more little note. I am starting a crazy intense five-week class and a new graduate program this week, followed by another five-week class and a, another five-week class. You know, I'm trying to time this for when my kiddos are finishing up their school. So I'm going to be doing my very best to stay on our bi-weekly schedule, but you know what they say about the best laid plans of mice and men. So, you know, say a prayer for me if you think about it. I'd appreciate it. I want to thank you for joining me today. Look, I know there are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you took this time to spend with me. I hope you will join me for my next podcast when we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and sharing it on social media and giving it a good review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and following me on Facebook and Instagram? Oh, oh, and maybe you could say that Christian Parent Crazy World is the best podcast you've ever heard in your entire life. uh, Just a thought. Uh, And be sure to check out my website, which is katherineseegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. 
I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time. Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. To hear more from Catherine Seegers, visit her site, katherinesegers.com. If you enjoyed this episode, would you take a minute and leave us a rating and review in your podcast app? It really does help us connect to more listeners like you. A special thanks to Kelly Gibbons, Stephen Sanders, and Stephen McGarvey for their production and editing on this episode. You can find more podcasts like this over at lifeaudio.com. Todos los grandes jugadores tienen sus rituales, todos. Como soplarle a los dados, a los dardos, a la petanca y hasta soplarle al test de antígenos para que dé negativo. Sea cual sea tu ritual, en Codere te lo ponemos fácil. Vive la emoción de jugar a las ruletas en vivo de Codere, estés donde estés. Descárgala. Así de fácil. Codere. Juega con responsabilidad. Sin diversión no hay juego. Mayores de 18. Todos los grandes jugadores tienen sus rituales. Todos. Como pasarle todo por la cabeza a tu amigo el calvo para darte suerte. Pedro, nunca visites Turquía. Sea cual sea tu ritual, en Codere te lo ponemos fácil. Cobra tus apuestas más rápido y fácil en nuestros más de 2.500 locales y en cajeros. Así de fácil. Codere. Juega con responsabilidad. Sin diversión no hay juego. Mayores de 18.